Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our next installment of uh, the uh, Planners Gathering virtual series, uh, uh, Stormwater Standards. Uh, today we have Valerie Novice from OHM here and uh, a few things before we get started. Uh, just a reminder, this meeting's being recorded, so please mute your audio and turn off your camera. Uh, and please type your questions into the chat box after the presentation, we'll address as many questions from the chat as possible. And without further ado, uh, here's Valerie Novice. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ryan. Can everyone see um, a rain garden with a title slide? Yes, okay. Um, well, thanks for joining this morning uh, virtually. I hear there's a, a, a record-breaking turnout, and I'm certain that it's uh, related to the content and not my um, not because you all wanted to see me. Uh, but hopefully this morning um, we'll have some worthwhile content. Um, I promise you I will not answer all of the questions that are looming in your head. Um, but my hope is that we advance the conversation forward and work through some of the questions and continue to get those questions out in the open as they relate to post-construction stormwater standards. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a Michigan native. I graduated from Michigan State University uh, with both my bachelor's and my master's degree. Um, I did a study abroad in Brazil, which I learned an extreme amount about um, urban design and um, conservation concepts, but that's also where I met my husband. I brought him back here to the States, um, so I studied real hard. Um, I am currently a, a water resources engineer. Um, my background by trade and by experience is predominantly in the stormwater and surface water arena. Um, I'm a senior project manager and a principal, and I'm also the firm stormwater practice leader. I think more importantly though, I really do have a passion for nature. Um, I grew up in a household, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a household where um, my, my family really placed the value and taught me the emphasis and importance of um, being one with nature. And so that has carried me through my career and certainly my um, area of experience. I'm also an avid runner and I'm not afraid to get dirty when I run. Um, so today we're gonna go over um, why we manage stormwater. I teach a, um, a stormwater class at Lawrence Tech on design of stormwater management systems. And what I've found is that when we remind ourselves of why we're doing what we're doing, um, we seem to grasp that concept better. So I'm taking us back to our academic roots um, as we work through the, the material today. Um, and then how did we manage stormwater? We're gonna take a small history lesson to figure out where we've been to understand where we are today and, um, and where we are gonna be going into the future. <clears throat> I promise I will leave some time for questions at the end. Um, and I apologize in advance if my kids come running downstairs, I will try and mute if that happens. Um, okay, so at the global scale, um, we have a lot of water that exists on earth, um, but most of that water, about 97% of it is salt water in the oceans. So only a small sliver of that water is fresh water. And of that small sliver, about 3%, 2.5%, only 1% of that 3% of the water is actually available to us in surface or fresh water. The rest of that water is in either glaciers and ice caps, which we know the value of preserving those, and then found in groundwater. And um, so although we have a lot of water on earth, um, only a small portion of it is easily accessible to us for our daily water supply needs, which makes preserving that um, all that much more critical and important. And um, I'm a Michigan native. All of us, I think, are um, doing work in the great state of Michigan. And so we have some amazing resources here um, with the Great Lakes and all the inland lakes that we have. 
um, we have about 84% of all of the fresh water in North America in and around our state. And so um, a lot of times we'll hear that uh, Michigan has more stringent standards. That's certainly true when it comes to the combined sewer overflow policy, but there's a reason for that because we have a lot of the resources. By the numbers, we have, you know, few thousand miles of freshwater coastline, um, thousands of inland lakes, 75,000 miles of rivers, and then millions of acres of wetlands. Um, so it's a big group. I'm not sure um, we necessarily want to do a poll, but when you think about the largest source of pollution to our world's freshwaters, what comes to mind? And just think about it for a minute or put that answer in your head or um, um, we don't necessarily need to put it in the chat. Uh, but if you thought stormwater, you are correct. Stormwater is the fastest growing source of freshwater pollution in the world today. Um, and there are two main components that um, are embedded into that, that stormwater pollution. Um, component. There's, oops, there is um, how much stormwater is running off, so the quantity, but also the quality. And, um, you know, these images just kind of reflect some of the, the headlines that we see um, going on today. Um, and, and why is that stormwater the fastest growing source of pollution? Well, because we continue to uh, urbanize our landscapes. And so when we convert a forested area or a undeveloped area to an urbanized space, um, the runoff volumes are about 16 times higher. Um, and so we, we have to manage that water. And in some instances, uh, we haven't historically managed that water. And in some instances we've attempted and, and maybe fallen short um, but that's that's kind of the driver for the need. Looking at Southeast Michigan, Oakland County is no exception to the development um, arena. Uh, we have a large percentage of our land area that's been developed. You can see Detroit was largely developed um, before the 1970s, but we've had a lot of development in the Southeast Michigan area um, outside of the 70s. Okay, so um, now we're gonna take a little stroll down memory lane um, and look at how we have managed stormwater over time. Um, so going back to the 19th century, the, the 1800s, drainage practices were really limited um, because people lived close to or right next to streams, rivers, or other bodies of water. And that was required because there wasn't necessarily the infrastructure or the tools or the need to bring um, water out further from um, the, the local water bodies. And urban stormwater runoff, or what was thought of as urban stormwater runoff and industrial wastewater were the primary, primary waste discharges into those local streams and rivers. And so the focus was on conveyance, getting the stormwater to the ditches, which also included um, sanitary waste, and there really wasn't any focus on proper flood control and certainly at this time, no regard for, for public safety. Whoops. Okay, um, so as we moved into the 20th century, um, that's when we saw really a boom in, in the industrial era and in really the growth and um, of, of the population and development. So the focus was more on getting the water out of sight, underground, um, but there wasn't really a distinction between sewage and surface stormwater runoff. So we um, built what we now know today as large combined sewers, um, which in a lot of our communities, we still have combined sewer systems. So get the water out of sight, out of mind, and be able to um, continue to develop and build the land for for growth and prosperity. Uh, then as we moved into the, the mid 20th century, uh, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act was formed in the, about the 1940s. And the focus initially was primarily on navigation, but also addressed water pollution prevention. We are starting to see some of the implications 
of what we um, our practices of um, putting wastewater and stormwater untreated into our local rivers and streams. So this is about the time when we learned or decided that combined sewers were bad and that we needed to treat the water in some capacity before we discharge to the, um, the local rivers and streams. And um, it's also where we had massive projects to enhance the stormwater conveyance component of our combined sewers. Um, so does anyone remember the Cuyahoga River fire? Um, well, what was new to me a while back was that um, there was Cuyahoga River fires. So um, the Cuyahoga River caught fire for the 13th time in the 19, in the late 1960s, which is what ultimately um, precipitated the what we now know today as the Clean Water Act in 1972. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act this year. Um, and it established the basic structure for regulating pollutants discharging into waters of the state. Um, it also set a mandate that all rivers throughout the US be hygienic enough to safely allow mass amounts of swimmers and fish within the waters by 1983. Um, well, we'll get to where we are today, um, about 40 years after that time frame. So coming off of um, the newly enacted Clean Water Act, there was a rise of the stormwater detention. Um, there was a focus on slowing down the runoff, controlling the flooding downstream. Um, it was also the time of the energy crisis for those that were um, around during that period. And um, there were also multiple amendments since the original Clean Water Act that focused on setting specific minimum water quality standards for those fishable and swimmable waters at the local municipal level. And that really led to the creation of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NPDES, phase one program. Um, and the phase one program regulated medium and large municipal separate storm sewer systems serving populations of 100,000 or greater, and then construction activities disturbing five acres of land or greater. Plus there was some categorical industrial discharges that were regulated. This is also another time where we saw a steep growth in land development. Um, some of the phase one communities by reference, Grand Rapids, Warren, Sterling Heights, Lansing, Ann Arbor, and Flint. There were only a few in the state of Michigan that met that phase one community criteria. Um, and then in the <clears throat> in the 2000s, uh, the federal government uh, revised the NPDES phase, phase program to include a phase two, which regulated smaller communities. And I think most of the communities now in Michigan um, that are considered urbanized fall into this category where we're focusing on those six minimum measures. So public education and participation, public outreach, illicit discharge elimination, construction runoff controls, post-construction runoff controls, and then pollution prevention and good housekeeping. It was also what I like to call part two of the energy crisis. And also where there started, we started to see a push for sustainable design or um, the buzzword at the time was low impact development or LID practices. So um, I would argue, though, that there's still some room for improvement. If you look at some of the conditions from the 19th century to um, the 2000s or today, uh, while we've come a long way, I think there's still a long way to go. Uh, our current environment, we're not only dealing with water quality issues, water quantity issues within our lakes and streams, but um, massive storm events that um, have historically not necessarily been seen. And on top of that, um, we have some, some serious water quality issues. There's cyanobacteria blooms that are currently estimated to impact about 30 million people. Um, there are special pots of funding to address the cyanobacteria blooms. Um, we still have billions of gallons of untreated sewage discharging into our lakes and streams annually. Um, billions of gallons of partially treated sewage and um, 
The worst piece of that is that it's backing up into people's homes and creating a public health issue. Um, so the other thing that you see not uncommon in the headlines is Michigan beach closures that are occurring because of bacteria, um, primarily driven by urban stormwater runoff or combined sewer discharges. Um, if you look at the state level, um, we have we still have lots of total maximum daily loads, which is basically a, a regulatory limit set to try and control the, the pollutants of greatest concern in our watersheds. The image you see on the left is um, that basically the TMDLs that excluding E. coli bacteria and PCBs, and then the E. coli TMDL locations are on the right. Um, and you can see a correlation with a lot of our urban centers. Um, and then these are some figures of um, where we are not supporting or attaining or meeting that fishable, swimmable um, condition that the Clean Water Act was in initially um, or designed to, to address. And there are quite a few areas across the state of Michigan that we're not attaining that safe, swimmable, fishable condition. Um, so, you know, I gave, I painted a very bleak picture and um, we kind of have two options. We can really bury our heads in the sand um, and just ignore um, what the, the issues that face us today, or we can um, continue to, to try and innovate and do things um, that we haven't done and that might be uncomfortable. Um, one of my one of my favorite quotes is, if you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done. And so with that um, come the goals of the county stormwater program. Um, some of the key goals are basically to ensure that there are consistent, straightforward standards that meet those state permit requirements that were um, that are passed through the federal government that are all again stem from the federal Clean Water Act. Um, we want to address water quality and channel and infrastructure protection, and we'll get to the standards um, in a little bit. We really want to promote volume reducing um, BMPs, low impact development measures, and make sure that whatever we're putting in is going to be able to be maintained and does get maintained over the long term. Um, and then to, to promote consistent stormwater reporting, tracking and mapping, figuring out um, where the assets are, what they are, um, how they're functioning is no different than our drinking water assets or our waste or our wastewater and, and um, sanitary assets. By way of reminder, uh, the county's stormwater authority applies to direct discharges to a designated county drain um, through a county park or a county owned property. And then encouraged but not yet codified is um, direct connections to a county combined sewer. Um, what is not county jurisdiction is local stormwater systems that do not directly um, connect to a county owned or, or operated system. And then the Road Commission of Oakland County is a separate jurisdiction. Okay, so where do the rules apply? All development and redevelopment projects that have construction activity greater than or equal to one acre. Um, that is the county level standard. Local communities may have a lower threshold for that. Um, they might have something smaller than an acre, but in terms of the county standards and what's regulated, it's construction activity greater than or equal to one acre. Okay, so there are three main components to the stormwater rules. But first, um, let's look at rainfall by the numbers. So on average, Oakland County receives roughly 32 inches of rainfall per year. And that rainfall occurs across approximately 70 rain events per year. Might change a little bit um, each year, but overall the long-term average. 90% of those events are less than one inch of rainfall. For those that like to see things graphically or pictorially, um, this is a statistical non-exceedance analysis of hourly rainfall data from the Detroit Metro Airport for a period of about 65 years through 2013 for runoff producing events. 
And um, what this graph shows is the size rainfall event that is not exceeded um, on the, the y-axis. So in other words, a one inch rainfall event, 90% um, of all the storms in Michigan are less than or equal to one inch of rainfall. And as of 2013, 100% of those rainfall events are less than four inches of rainfall. Um, if we updated this graph using rainfall through 2021, the rain event axis and the 100% line would certainly be out farther, probably in the, the six, seven, or eight, depending on which rain gauge we used. So most of the rain events in Michigan are less than one inch of rainfall. So we have small frequent storm events. Why is that important? Our small storm events are responsible for the most annual urban runoff and most of the pollutants that wash off from our urban surfaces. So that's how the water quality criteria, which is key component number one of the stormwater rules was derived. So the water quality criteria is focused on um, treating the, the rainfall from a one inch storm event. That means stripping out the solids, stripping out the sediments and cleaning that water before it continues on into the receiving streams. Okay, the next set of requirements is really rooted in channel geomorphology. Um, for those that are not geomorphologists, I am not one myself, um, stream channels and kind of the top of stream bank elevations are naturally formed during what is called a channel forming flow condition, um, which that generally equates to somewhere between a one year and a two year rainfall event, um, which is about a two year rainfall event is about 2.3 inches. Um, that's the flows that create and sustain a stable stream channel that's not subject to erosion and um, uh, scour. And there's two components to those stable stream flows. There's the overall quantity of stormwater, so the volume and the speed or rate at which that water is coming into and flowing through the stream channel. Looking at that graphically, um, you can see the, the blue line here is, uh, I'm looking at within the urban stream. I'm not looking at a site level, but this is the, the response and the flow in an urban stream. And you can see uh, pre-development um, during a rain event, you might get a little spike, but what I wanna focus on is this base flow. And this base flow is basically the, the quantity of water that's in balance that's being charged from the groundwater and other site conditions naturally. And that base flow is where that channel forming flow um, is derived from. And so that's important because when we look at the requirements for channel protection, both volume and rate control, they're focused on getting as close as possible to that base flow condition. And so the second key criteria um, for the county stormwater standards is the volume control for the channel protection. And that's a 1.3 inch rainfall event. And that is basically infiltrated on your site. So the goal is for the 1.3 inch rainfall event for that water to never make it off your site into the receiving waters or the county's system. Now there's a caveat to that, to the maximum extent practicable. Um, so what is the maximum extent practicable for that infiltration requirement? Um, well, if you have measured soil infiltration rates less than 0.24 inches per hour, um, then we don't need to force infiltration. If the prevailing long-term groundwater table is within two vertical feet, of where the proposed infiltration stormwater practice is, then we're not gonna expect infiltration. Um, and then if there's contaminated soils on site, we do not want to um, create a, a plume or a contamination plume that we're spreading contaminants by trying to, to manage stormwater locally at the source. The whole goal is to, 
protect water quality, we don't want to spread um, pollution by, by doing that. If, if a site meets any one of those criteria, it's not, it's an or, not an and, um, then the infiltration component is waived. Um, okay, so the second piece of that channel protection component to, to get to that, that um, base flow condition is the, the, the rate piece, how fast the water is coming in. And for that, the, the key component or the key requirement is um, extended detention for 48 hours of the 1.9 inch rainfall event. Um, and then the other piece for rate control is we want we want to address flood control. We want to address those that last 10% of the storms, the large infrequent storms to make sure that we're not um, creating large flooding scenarios. And, and for that criteria, um, we have to size our detention for a 100 year, 24 hour storm with a variable release rate and a storage curve. And I'm gonna get to that in a second. So size the detention to manage the stormwater runoff from the site for a 100 year, 24 hour storm. Um, we tried to make this really simple in terms of the calculation. So there is a single storage curve equation um, that we can use to size our detention pond on our site. You need um, three of the four variables. You either need um, your, your available storage volume um, or your total runoff volume, your peak outflow discharge and your peak inflow discharge. So you're generally gonna calculate this as part of your site calculations, your peak inflow discharge. Um, your peak outflow discharge is your allowable release rate. Historically, that was 0.15 CFS per acre. Um, the revised standards allow for a variable release rate depending on the size of the site, ranging from 0.15 CFS per acre up to one CFS per acre for smaller sites. So um, let's just say, for instance, my allowable discharge for my site, I have a small site that I'm developing, is one CFS per acre. My peak inflow is two CFS per acre. So I take one divided by two, that's 0.5. Um, so I'm going to go on the 0.5 line on this graph, and then I'm going to um, I'm going to come over, or or I can just plug my value into the equation. I now have my x value, which is 0.5, and then I can figure out my y. Um, and that is my the um, ratio of my storage volume divided by my runoff volume. I've calculated my runoff volume. I can then determine my storage volume. Okay, so in summary, the three key components to the county stormwater regulations are water quality control, that's the one inch storm event, strip the solids out, strip the sediment out, strip the pollutants out, and then let it continue down into the receiving stream. The second component is the volume control for channel protection, and that is infiltrating the runoff from the 1.3 inch storm event to the maximum extent practicable. The third component is the rate control, the, the channel protection. We have the extended detention for the 1.9 inch storm event. And then we have flood control for a 100 year, 24 hour storm event. Um, I will note that if you cannot, or you have determined measure that you cannot infiltrate on the site, then the default is going to be this channel protection extended detention. Um, and we'll talk through a couple site examples um, in a minute. Visually, what we are trying to do with these standards is when we convert our land, our natural areas to an urbanized area, we are trying to recreate the hydrology such that the runoff leaving the site is functioning as close to as close as possible as what was there before we developed the site. So we are trying to recreate or mimic the natural hydrology as much as possible. Okay, so what are the implications when it comes to site planning? Um, 
this image here, you, you've seen it a lot. You've um, it's been in the news a lot. Flooding. We want to make sure that we're avoiding um, both catastrophes and long-term implications to water quality and water quantity. And keep in mind that um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's always easier to prevent than it is to fix after the fact. Think about the reduce, recycle, um, that, that circle, um, reduce, reuse, recycle. It's always easier to reduce first, then reuse, and then lastly, recycle. So how do we prevent? Um, well, we look at non-structural BMPs, and that's that's really trying to, to minimize as much as possible the disturbance on any given site. Um, these are not new concepts to any of us, but just kind of a reminder, um, protecting our sensitive areas. If we can do cluster development, that was a buzzword um, probably in the 90s. I haven't heard it as much today. Um, can we reduce imperviousness? Do we need all the parking spaces that we have planned out? In some instances for zoning um, conditions, we do, other times we don't. Um, and then disconnecting our, our, our stormwater from um, the system, trying to let that water have a chance to soak into the ground and do what it did before we developed the site. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about disturbance and, and primarily compaction. Um, so there's a lot we can do to minimize and promote infiltration on our sites by just minimizing the compaction. So let's say we have an area on our site that um, is not conducive to putting a specific or strategic stormwater management practice, um, but it's going to be turf grass. It's going to be um, a, a grassed area. If we can lower the amount of compaction in that turf grass area, we are likely to see a significant increase in infiltration rates. So take a, a pasture site here. Um, the, the teal bar is in a non-compacted state. And then um, you can see the impacts of compaction. We're losing about 90% of the infiltration capacity. So if we can just make even the areas that we aren't intentionally um, placing stormwater management practices, if we can make those as light and fluffy soils as possible, we can we can go a long way in, in managing stormwater and mimicking that natural hydrology. Um, I, I can't stress enough the value of um, native plants. Uh, the root system here on the left, this is an image that most of us have probably already seen, but the the root system here on the left is turf grass, and then all of these are a variation of prairie or native plants. Native plants not only have deeper roots, but they drink more water and they actually um, break up the compaction of, of the soils below as, as the roots penetrate into the ground. So um, going back to this compaction, um, if we plant some, some native or deeper rooting plants, we can then further mimic that natural hydrology. Um, so moving into, okay, we've disturbed our site, we've done what we can to minimize the disturbed area. Now we're getting into structural BMPs and figuring out how we're going to manage the stormwater for those three criteria. By way of reminder, again, um, stripping the solids and the sediments out for the one inch rainfall event, um, infiltrating to the maximum extent feasible for the 1.3 inch event, um, extended detention for a 1.9 inch rainfall event, and then detention for the large, the 100 year, 24 hour storm event, which is about a five, five and a half inch rainfall event. Um, so some of the more common structural BMPs, um, permeable pavements, bioretention, vegetated swales, planter boxes, green roofs, um, cisterns, wetlands, and extended detention ponds. So thinking about a site um, and laying out a site, this image is from the DWSD stormwater manual. Um, and it, for those that haven't seen the DWSD manual, they, it does a nice job of walking through site planning considerations. I believe it's chapter three of that manual. Um, so 
talking through just some of the considerations to think about when we're laying out our site. Um, if you have the benefit of starting a site plan for a brand new development, you get a clean slate to integrate stormwater management early into the, the process. Um, when possible, we should be targeting to place our buildings on the poorer draining soils, so the, the C soils, the D soils, the clayier soils, and reserving any locations of good draining soils for stormwater management. Um, how do you know that? Uh, well, generally, we're going to have to take a soil, soil profile or do some on-site um, soil investigation to figure out what the soils are on our site. Um, but the other piece of that is um, we can have great soils anywhere we want, but last I heard, um, there are no inventions that change the longstanding notion that water flows downhill. Um, so when we're placing our stormwater management practices, just because we have great draining soils, um, if we can't get the water to that area, then it's not going to work. Um, now, it doesn't mean we we strategically place our building on top of that soil, so then we say we can't get our water to that location. Um, but if that, that good draining soil is also the high point on the site, without substantial regrading, we're not going to get the stormwater there. And that really is not um, probably the most effective means of managing stormwater. So our stormwater practices should be located where water either naturally or is graded to flow to. Once we get the water to the low spot though, we have to be able to drain the water um, out if it's not going to infiltrate. So one of the, um, some of the best laid plans, um, we've found that we, we can't get the water out. The, the hydraulics, the connection to the sewer system um, via gravity, doesn't work. Water would have to flow uphill to get out of our stormwater practice and into the sewers. So it's important to think about um, not only the, the horizontal placement on our site, but the vertical um, reality of getting that water out. Otherwise, we are going to end up with um, cesspools of stormwater that look bad, that um, smell bad, and that breed mosquitoes. By way of reminder, water does not flow uphill unless we force it to, um, which is going to require some sort of mechanical um, or operation and maintenance practice. Um, other site planning considerations, um, we got to work around utilities. So this is more for redevelopment than for new development. We're talking about on the site. Um, this was actually a, a, the um, bioretention gardens in downtown Lansing. Um, leading up to the Capitol, where there is tons of underground utility, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, we are able to work around the utilities, incorporate them into the design, and successfully um, install bioretention practices. All right, so let's walk through this so a site layout example. Um, so this is a, a a redevelopment site where um, we have an existing building. Um, and some parking space and we want to expand um, or, or let's, yeah. So on average, or generally speaking, our water quality and that volume control infiltrations, that 1.3 inch rainfall event is going to occupy about five to 8% of the land area um, relative to the, the impervious area treated. So the image on the right, is incorporating infiltration to meet that 1.3 inch um, rainfall event. And you can see the, the green boxes represent the physical space that would be required to manage that 1.3 inch rainfall event. The trade-off is that the detention pond, so the flood control and that extended detention for the 1.9 inch event are going to be smaller because we're crediting that space with what we've already managed in our, our green infiltration practices, um, which could mean uh, there's room for additional parking spaces uh, on the site. Okay, so um, thinking about how we can do those green boxes, uh, there's a number of different things that we can look at. 
uh, permeable pavements. There's a ton of different practices. My personal favorite um, is the permeable interlocking concrete pavers. They seem to hold up the best. They're easiest to maintain and they're more forgiving it with um, lower maintenance frequency. Um, this is at the EPA headquarters. There's an example of um, gra a grass paved system. And this one is um, permeable concrete. Uh, we can also incorporate bioretention um, into our parking lot islands. Um, if we do that, the islands are generally going to need to be a little bit larger than what we would design if we weren't managing stormwater um, within them. And we have to make sure that we can get the water in them. Um, so we want to provide either curb cuts if it's um, butting up to, to cars um, parking on either side of that, or if we can get away with no curb, um, then, then we incorporate that. Um, Deeper rooted plants um, are great if codes allow for that. Um, so a lot of times we have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, a screening wall um, as a requirement of codes. But are there instances where we can use that screening wall to also manage stormwater? Um, sometimes we need taller plants, but um, there are taller native plants that can accommodate that. So rethinking how we're um, incorporating stormwater management into our site. The earlier we incorporate it, the easier it is to accommodate the stormwater. Um, and the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So sometimes we have to remember that we have to think outside the box. Um, and maybe we have to um, come up with a, a living wall, a vertical wall. Um, maybe our site just can't accommodate um, a horizontal placement of a stormwater practice. Uh, and for the record, this is not an example of stormwater management. Okay, a couple other things to note. Um, dumpsters can be a large source of bacteria and pollution to our waterways. This is a great example of what not to do when we're um, placing our, our dumpsters and our trash on our site plans. Um, we wanna make sure that they're sited away from the low spots. They're covered if possible. Um, are they curbed? Do we have a way to to collect the water that might be leaking from them um, before it gets to the, the storm sewer system? And can we sheet flow um, any stormwater that might come in contact with those dumpsters to a vegetated area before it uh, connects directly to the storm sewer? In this instance, there's a storm uh, sewer inlet, a catch basin right here. So it doesn't take a lot of, um, a stretch to realize that we're, we're getting runoff from these dumpsters straight into the storm sewer system. Okay, maintenance is always the elephant in the room. Again, I will tell you, I do not have answers to 100% of the questions and um, concerns floating in your mind. Um, but by way of reminder, Maintaining stormwater systems is critical to ensuring that we're meeting the goals that we've we've set out for ourselves with the stormwater standards and um, going back to the, the Clean Water Act goals. So um, just like a garden at home, um, if, if we're not maintaining it, it's not going to look great and it's not going to function. And that perpetual maintenance and the record keeping is the responsibility of the property owner. Um, the requirements at the county level is to have a fully executed O&M agreement in place when the site plan is um, being approved. And that requires a legal description and identification of any easements for access. Um, a description of what the stormwater practices are, uh, where they are, um, what the agreement includes, what is the maintenance plan, what is the frequency at which maintenance is going to be done, and who's going to do that maintenance, and then um, having some GIS data available to submit for tracking. Uh, 
Um, and with that, uh, I will open it up to questions. Um, I leave you with a kind of a parting thought of um, if we don't manage stormwater for ourselves, let's manage it for the future generations. Okay, thanks, Valerie. Uh, this is Jim Schaefer. Um, I'm going to moderate the questions out of the chat box. So if you have questions and haven't had an opportunity, uh, go ahead and put those in there um, and I'll get going. Um, Valerie, the first question, uh, property assessed clean energy pace uh, financing is available to developers and building owners to help meet the goals of the stormwater program. Is there any conversations happening between the county and the lean and green machine, excuse me, lean and green Michigan, uh, the public private administrator for the PACE program statewide. PACE makes stormwater mitigation control possible since payment occurs up to 25 years with zero down for developers and building owners. Lynn, are you available to, to address that one? The, the, summarizing the question I heard, you know, the funding that's available is the county um, engaging in those dialogues to figure out how that can that funding can be utilized at the county level. I think I summarized that correctly. Uh, the quick answer is to date, no, but it is something we can look into. Okay. All right, and uh, let's see. All right, next question. Uh, stormwater on Clarkston Road approaching North Main in the village of Clarkston is not being uh, maintained or managed, excuse me. Uh, the Road Commission uh, for Oakland County uh, will cap and replave Clarkston Road this summer. Uh, without doing anything to manage the stormwater. Uh, the risk of environmental damage to Lower Mill Pond and Park Lake in Clarkston Village. Park Lake flows into the Clinton River Watershed Council. Uh, road commissions limited to capping and repaving Clarkston Road due to contamination from a gasoline plume in uh, from 148 North Main muffler shop uh, leaking underground storage tanks were removed in 90 and 91. Uh, contamination continues to exist under Clarkston Road um, and North Main. Uh, what can be done about it? Wow. Um, so if I understand the situation, um, the Road Commission, and I see someone's on from the Road Commission, I won't put you on the spot right now, um, but feel free to add on to my response. Um, there's some some road work occurring, and um, there we're limited in what we could do to manage stormwater and infiltrate stormwater um, nearby because we have um, contamination plumes. So what could be done? Um, well, from a uh, from a feasibility standpoint, um, or what's what's possible. Um, there are there are ways to manage stormwater and not force infiltration and still um, result in an impact. So um, a aligned or an impermeable um, detention practice could be um, one of those solutions where we're um, conveying the water to a, a detention feature that um, it is then managing that stormwater, filtering it out, and um, making sure that we're not coming in contact with those contamination plumes, and then slowly releasing that into the downstream receiving uh, water body. That will generally require probably a bigger physical footprint, and the road agencies are, are linear assets, and so they don't necessarily have a lot of space um, off of the right-of-way to do that. So it, it becomes a, a, a challenge when we're talking about space constraints, especially in our urbanized areas. Um, so, so that's one option. I don't know if um, anyone from the Road Commission who's on might um, want to um, 
Oh, Kelly says to, to contact the road commission. There we go. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, great. Um, next question, uh, adding 5% organic material to new construction sites can capture millions of gallons of water and sediment pollution from running into the watershed. The Soils for Salmon program in Washington state literally saved their salmon population from completely dying off by adding organics to new construction sites. Uh, there is a similar program called Landscape for the Lakes here in Michigan that people are trying to get started. Is there any consideration or knowledge of amending lifeless barren soils with high quality certified compost. Uh, the compost won't only help capture water, it will also capture and degrade runoff pollutants. Uh, that, that's a great point and a great question. Um, one of the things I try and do first, if I'm um, designing bioretention in, into a site, is to try and um, amend the existing soils as opposed to um, removing the existing soils and bringing in new light fluffy soils. Um, the light fluffy soils that are engineered soils um, are a challenge with contractors to get right. And so is there an opportunity to, um, to, to amend those soils with something such as compost, maybe wood chips, um, to, to make them more conducive to infiltration. That could be applied across the site as well, not just for the site stormwater practices. I'm not aware of any um, policy level or overarching um, uh, pushes to do that at a, at a countywide scale. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, further questions in the chat box at this moment. If you do have any, please do go ahead and, and type them in there. Oh, here we go. Um, when implementing the new county stormwater standards, how is it determined that the plan is creating infiltration to the extent practicable? Different interpretations could lead to conflicts with other permits. Uh, that's a great question. I will tell you it's a question that is being discussed at the county level um, and across the counties to, to try and better define or come up with a, a, a clear set of, of checklist requirements that, that says what is MEP. Um, I, I think it, the reality is it's a, it's a little gray and it's always subject to interpretation when um, we're we're talking about the world that we live in. Um, certainly, if we keep in mind the why, um, we're more likely to find a way forward. Um, another way to think about it is maybe we can't infiltrate the full 1.3 inch event. Maybe we can infiltrate a half inch um, storm event. And going back to that non-exceedance graph, that's still about 50% of the, the um, the storm events that we see in Michigan in any given year. So just because we can't do the full criteria doesn't mean we shouldn't try something. Um, I didn't necessarily speak to the MEP um, criteria. Lynn, I don't know if you wanna jump in and give an update on that or not. Sure, so we're meeting uh, on a regular basis at WRC every two weeks to sort of figure out what that MEP is gonna look like for the county. And then we um, have a work group set up with the local municipalities in which we'll present that and see if we have consensus on um, the MEP being a good approach. So we're hoping to have something by the end of summer. Our goal is to have something that is somewhat consistent. So if you have a site coming in, you can go in knowing that if you do a certain design or propose something, you'll be close to getting an approval, there might still be some conversation. Every site differs, um, but we'll have kind of a list of things we're looking at that could help achieve that MEP with an ultimate goal of what, what is that quantifiable uh, MEP number. So we don't have any answers yet, but we're working on it. And then we plan to discuss it with all the communities and the regional group. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question, are there, any ongoing discussions on how the new stormwater standards apply to the George C 
raccoon drainage district communities. Lynn, I'm gonna take, let you take that one again. Uh, so yes, there are conversations of what we're gonna do with GWK. If you look at our standards right now, we have sort of like a placeholder for it. Um, the approach we're taking with GWK and um, most likely applying to our other combined districts is uh, climate resiliency. We know what our system was designed for, storm intensities are changing as Valerie pointed out in her presentation. And so we're looking to see what would it take to just um, preserve the system for climate resiliency going maybe into 2040. We're working with Val and Drummond Carpenter to evaluate that. Um, so it's, again, something we're working on. We're hoping to have something to present to the GWK communities, um, maybe early fall and have a discussion on that and what it looks like for, um, for the drain. Okay, great. Um, next question, what are your recommended soil testing measures and frequency for determining infiltration rates of a particular site? Soils can vary over large sites and therefore infiltration rates can vary as well. Can any of the undeveloped portions of a large site be used in calculating the infiltration rate? Uh, for purposes of designing infiltration practices and determining if infiltration is feasible on the site, um, we want to kind of figure out where we're targeting to put the stormwater practice first. So that's looking at site grading. Again, water doesn't flow uphill. Um, so where, where can we put the stormwater infiltration practice? <clears throat> Any site soil conditions we know ahead of time it helps that even more. By the time we're getting to um, designing our infiltration practice, we're gonna need to take an, infiltra uh, an on-site infiltration test at the target location of that infiltration practice. So if, we, if we're targeting infiltration in the bottom right corner of our site, that's where we're gonna wanna take the boring um, to determine what our infiltration rate is. Um, and then if, if we find out, oh, we have extremely tight soils in our infiltration rate, I've gotten it measured infiltration rates of 0. 0.00000, um, so essentially no infiltration, we're not gonna infiltrate there. Um, in terms of the quantity, it depends on the site and the number of practices that you might need. Again, we're gonna want to see or know um, what the measured infiltration rate is for the proposed stormwater practice location. Okay, next question is how is public education being handled, uh, particularly for homeowners who may be dealing with complex stormwater issues? Um, I might need some clarification on that question. Well, I think it differs, you know, with every community. And um, I know at the county level, we have JC Garrison, who does all of our outreach. And she, we do um, advertisements, especially in like Lakefront um, magazines. And she has an extensive outreach with communities. And we just started a master um, rain garden program where we're reaching out and working with residents. So if you need like a lot of detail, I would refer you to JC Garrison from our office. You could give you some additional resources that are available. Um, it is occurring, you know, a lot of it is relied upon with the Clinton River Watershed Council or the other watershed councils in Oakland County. Um, but, you know, there's always room for improvements. So if you have ideas or you have ideas where you want to collaborate, reach out to us. Lynn, could, if you might, uh, could you put uh, her contact information in the chat? And then if also maybe a link to your website where these standards uh, are located for folks so it's easily accessible? Sure. Okay. All right, the next, uh, next question, uh, when will PFAS implications uh, suggested recently by federal uh, information and increased health risk be reflected in Michigan and Oakland County regulations? Oh my, um, to be determined is the short answer for that. Um, 
PFAS is still a, what I would consider an emerging contaminant. So there's a lot of um, flurry and activity going on still at the federal government. Um, so if I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't say that we're looking at it at a, a stormwater runoff level um, in the short term. Okay. Um, there is growing interest in how native plants can assist infiltration. Could Oakland County convene uh, possible growers to increase availability? Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of the county, um, but if there's enough interest, I'm sure that the county would be willing to understand what that looks like and how they could assist. Um, Native okay. plant suppliers is certainly a, um, a challenge. I myself, um, you know, try and plant natives in my garden and I had to um, sign up on a day and um, on one of the few public days that you can get native plants and then drive all the way out to Mason. I went out to wild type to get my plants um, and it's limited in what you can get. So I share that at a residential level um, as well. Okay. Uh, what are some BMPs that can be used for chronic lawn flooding in high clay, low infiltration areas? High clay, low infiltration areas. Um, at a, did, did you say residential? It doesn't say residential, but I'm guessing it says what are some BMPs that can be used for chronic lawn flooding in high clay, low infiltration areas. Oh, and I got a follow up. Yes, residential. High clay. Oh, I thought it was high play. Um, native plants are probably the easiest thing to do, right? Plants not only um, promote infiltration, even in tight um, draining soils, but they also drink the drink the stormwater. Um, they evapotranspire it and then they um, they promote the infiltration into the ground. So um, if you can and it's conducive, I would say um, planting natives um, is probably the easiest. I mean, um, we got to pick a water loving plant, plant that might like um, habitual or wet soil conditions. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, if you have them out there, please do uh, add them in the chat. And Lynn did include uh, the contact information uh, for JC uh, in the chat, if you wanna make note of that as well. All right, well, well thank you. Oh, here, everyone. well, we've, hold on, we've got another one here. <laughs> uh, will additional infiltration impact groundwater quality? Um, possibly is the short answer. So um, the whole, if, if we're infiltrating water through, um, vegetation, then the other piece that the vegetation serves is it's also going to to clean the water and, and strip out some of the contaminants that are associated with that. So most of the contaminants or the pollutants that we are dealing with are connected or tied to sediments. So if we pull the sediments out, we're going to pull most of those pollutants out, not all, but most of them. Um, so if we are infiltrating through a, um, a vegetative practice, we are settling that those solids out um, or we're doing that upstream of our infiltration practice or we're doing that through a mechanical separator under that water quality criteria before we get to a, a detention practice or um, we're releasing that water downstream. So we're, we're stripping those solids out. So that is the, the key reason why we have that, um, that water quality standard is to pull the sediments out because the pollutants are generally tied directly to that. So if we're forcing infiltration through a non-vegetated practice, um, we could be just forcing the pollutants um, straight into the groundwater and certainly something to consider. 
Okay, great. Uh, I do want to add that Lynn has also added in the chat a uh, direct link to <clears throat> the Water Resources Commission's uh, stormwater pages, uh, just for your reference. Um, and seeing no other questions, I'll turn it back over to Ryan to wrap it up. So yes, thank you, uh, Jim. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Valerie for joining us for your inform inform information, your um, presentation today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I want to also thank everyone for joining us. Um, just a reminder, we, we did record the session, so uh, give us a few and we will have it posted on our website. Um, Valerie, I assume it's okay to share your presentation uh, PDF? Okay, so we'll send that out to, uh, to all of the uh, registr registrants as well. So again, uh, thank you for joining us today and, uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.